Thank you, Devar. So I'll, yeah. So last time we ended with uh, with the with the precise statement of the um, uh, of the gross star conjecture. So let me point that out. So the precise statement it is this. So let me also go back a little further and say that. Uh, there, there's the this conjecture of Gross, which is which says that the order of vanishing of the periodic L function at s equal to zero is precisely the number of primes above p for which chi of that uh, number of primes v above p for which chi of uh, uh, v is one. Okay, uh, so I, I did not say it this way last time, but we had this field H. Uh, cut out by <clears throat> by chi, and so the the condition that chi of v is one is equivalent to saying that v splits completely in H. Okay, so there's the the conject this uh, conjecture about the precise order of vanishing of the periodic L function that the precise order of vanishing is uh, exactly the number of primes above p that split completely in H. Then. <clears throat> And the second uh, conjecture that Gross made was about the rth derivative of this periodic L function. So if the first conjecture is true, this is the leading term, but you don't need the uh, validity of the first conjecture to make the second statement. So he conjectured that the rth derivative is, uh, uh, is related to the complex L value times a periodic regulator. Okay, so this, this R factorial because you're taking derivative, but uh, the leading term is is the is the L value at zero of uh, uh, of of the complex L function and and then the periodic regulator. So we saw the definition of periodic regulator <clears throat> last time. Uh, it it has two um, sort of it depends on two maps. One is the odd map that goes from units to uh, the free abelian group generated by uh, uh, places. Uh, uh, of h above p, and the second is the uh, log of the norm, uh, log composed with norm that map. Okay, so this minus sign is some um, normalization that I have. Okay, and when you when you compose uh, L with with O inverse, so O is a is an isomorphism by Dirichlet's unit theorem. So when you compose L with O inverse, you, you get a map from X to itself or E tensor X to itself and, and you can take its determinant. So this is what is called the gross regulator. Okay. So that was the, this is our statement from, from last time. So the first thing I'm going to do today is to reformulate the, the conjecture, reformulate gross stark conjecture uh, in terms of existence of uh, certain cohomology classes, okay, uh, certain uh, global Galois cohomology classes. So that's our that's our first goal today. Um, okay, so again, we we kind of in these lectures we are changing uh, uh, topics very quickly. We kind of started with L functions, then went to modular forms, then back to L functions to state the conjecture, and now I'll talk. A little bit about uh, Galois cohomology, and then we will go back to modular forms again. Okay, so um, so this is the usual uh, Galois cohomology group that I'm not going to define. So recall that GF is the absolute Galois group of F, and uh, it acts on on this E vector space. So uh, maybe I should. So this is um, E with GF action by chi inverse. What this means is that sigma times E is chi inverse of sigma times E. So this is the action. This one is the, is the, is the multiplication inside E. Okay. So this is the, the GF module that I take, E vector space uh, module. So, uh, uh, so this is the usual Galois group. And I denote by H1 sub R all the classes in this uh, in this H1 on the right hand side, which are unramified outside primes in R1. Okay, so this is R1. Let me let me emphasize that this is R1. Okay, uh, R1 was was the set of all primes above p 
P for which chi of uh, those primes is not one. Okay, Th those primes above P which do not split completely in H. Okay, so <clears throat> so I take the no um, oh, sorry uh, no no the other way around. Let me yeah sorry uh, V is uh, all um, such that chi of v is equal to one. Sorry, it's it's equal to one. Yeah. So R one is the is the places above p which are which split completely in H. Uh, so I take H one sub R one to be uh, the all those cohomology classes that uh, that are unramified outside primes in R one. Okay. So this is uh, how do I how do I write this uh, in in terms of the classes? So there is a restriction map from uh, this cohomology group to this cohomology group. What is IV here? This is the inertia subgroup. Okay, so given any subgroup of G, you can always restrict the group cohomology. There's a restriction map from group cohomology of the group to, to the group cohomology of the subgroup. So this is the restriction map in each, in each component. And, uh, and we take the kernel of that. Okay, so this is this group. Okay. That's what it means. Um, all right. <clears throat> so, uh, so, so we will work. We'll work with this group. This is the usual thing in in, in number theory. You kind of don't care about all cohomology classes. You care about cohomology classes which are unramified outside a certain set. Uh, this is what you see in in definition of Selmer group and and so on. So. Um, Right, so uh, anything that comes from kind of arithmetic is is usually nice at almost all places, and only finitely many places are, are some somehow an issue. Okay, uh, but let's uh, let's study now. Now, I mean, these cohomology classes are unramified at uh, primes outside R one. So, what happens at prime in R one to the local cohomology? Let's look at that. So, what is the local cohomology? We know that chi of uh, uh, GP is one. Okay? This is this is precisely what it means for for chi of V to be one. Uh, this is so I, I'm sweeping a lot of class field theory under uh, un, uh, under this statement. So when I say chi of V is one, this is this is this is one. This is this is what happens on the Galois side. Okay, that's what happens on the on the side of ideals. This is what happens on the Galois side. Okay. Uh, this means that if you take this, sorry, I did not say what GP was, right? So GP is the decomposition subgroup. This is the decomposition. Subgroup, so earlier we saw inertia subgroup, this is the decomposition subgroup. So this decomposition subgroup uh, of, of GF, when you restrict the action of GF to the action, uh, of G sub P, we get trivial action because chi of GP is one, okay? So H1 in that case is just the, the set of all continuous homomorphisms from GP to E, okay? And this step uses, uh, uses local class field theory. So, so this step uses uh, local class field theory. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, this group, is, so homomorphisms from this group is same as homomorphisms from uh, uh, FP. So you, so non-zero elements in FP, but you have to periodically complete it. So, so this this means periodic completion. Okay, so this hat means uh, periodic completion. Otherwise, we get the whale group as we saw in one of the earlier talks, uh, Shonak's talk, I think. Okay, um, so now, uh, so, so the local uh, uh, Galois cohomology group is, is quite nice. It's just homomorphisms from FPs uh, cross hat to, to E. And we can write down some explicit homomorphisms, okay? Yeah, so we, we, we wrote them down earlier. And so I'll just recall them. So there's OP and LP, and these make sense for uh, uh, for uh, for elements of FP uh, star hat. Okay, 
so so recall uh, maybe i'll i'll just uh, yeah no, i i wrote odd right so it's odd and log of norm from fp to qp uh, so these two maps there are these two explicit uh, um, uh, maps from fp star to zp and zp is contained in uh, inside e so so there are these two explicit homomorphisms from from this group to to this um yeah you can write down some more explicitly but those are not uh, very useful for us okay um so these two homomorphisms will play a special role as as you can imagine because they played a special role in definition of the gross regulator <clears throat> okay so h1 sub r1 this group that we had uh, that we just defined on the previous slide we know that these are unramified outside r1 so at prime uh, so outside at places which are not in r1 these are unramified so nicely behaved and uh, and and so we uh, we kind of understand them now we want to restrict how they behave uh, uh, at uh, places in r1 so so this is the cyclotomic um, cohomology part of uh, of this h1 r and what is this these are all classes in h1 sub r1 uh, so that when you restrict to that particular to to a place in r1 uh, that restriction lands inside the uh, e vector space generated by lp and op okay so this is the e vector space generated by vector space generated by l sub p and o sub p okay so we are we are not concerned with uh, at the moment we are not concerned with uh, all classes in here we only want to study classes inside inside this okay <clears throat> and there is a nice proposition uh, so this is uh, yeah i'm not sure if this is written in our paper we so, yeah we don't need it but uh, for r equal to 1 this is uh, this is proven in in um, das gupta uh, darmo and pollock and the same proof uh, works uh, which is what i'm going to sketch now uh, so using the potutate sequence what you can actually show is that uh, uh, i should have some Sorry, I, sh I should have a. Um, this should be direct sum over all, all p. Okay, in in R one. Okay, um, so using potutate sequence, you can show that this H one is kernel uh, of this map. So what is this map? Th these are the local. This is the local part, and then. Uh, these local, I mean, you know, in part of the sequence, you have mapped from the local cohomology to H1 of the Tate dual of the module. So that's why here you, you get E1, E twisted by one. So this is the Tate, this is the Tate twist. Okay. So, uh, so the action of GF on this module is by multiplication by chi and uh, cyclotomic character. Okay, so that's the that's the Tate twist. Uh, so from this local thing, there is a map here. So this is uh, somehow the non-trivial part of the Potutate sequence, and you can show that H one is in fact kernel of this, and that this map is surjective. Okay, but this group is very nice. This is uh, basically Hilbert ninety tells you that this is units. Uh, uh, this U. Uh, this is the chi part of U tensor with E. Okay, so that's why we get that this has dimension R. We know that this has dimension 2R because this is two dimensional space. Uh, this is direct sum of uh, uh, R two dimensional spaces. So this has dimension 2R. So this means that this has dimension R. Okay, so that's uh, that's basically the proof. Uh, and de for details, you can look at uh, the Skutta Dharma and Pollock. Okay. Um, so up to now, I have been using sort of I, I did not enumerate 
elements in R1. So I'll, I'll do that now. So R1 will be all, uh, R1 will be P1, P2, P3, and PR. So I, I just name them. And I also fix a basis, uh, kappa 1, kappa 2, kappa R, for this uh, cyclotomic uh, cohomology class, the space of cyclotomic cohomology classes. Ah, oh, sorry. Um, oh, I mean, uh, okay, Hilbert. So this is, uh, you, I mean, this is how you compute cohomology of, uh, of uh, yeah, the, you, you can look this up in any kind of textbook on Galois cohomology, like Sayre's book, for instance, you, uh, this is how you compute the, the cohomology of um, like mu n mu n and then you have to take inverse limit and and tensor it with e uh, so so you use the sequence which goes from uh yeah I, I don't want to write it here mu n to k k bar to k bar and and then take the cohomology and and you get uh, you you get cohomology of mu n and and somewhere there you have to use uh, uh hilbert 9 okay all right. Yeah, so I think you lost my screen, right? Yes. Okay. Sorry, this is the internet issue. Uh, seems to happen every day at 2.15 or something. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, so, so this cyclotomic... Uh, the space of cyclotomic cohomology classes has dimension R. Okay, so uh, so what do we do? There's another piece of notation. So if I take the, so whenever I, I write uh, subscript I or subscript J, it means that I, 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 I want to write PI or PJ, but for ease of notation, I think it's better to just write uh, a restriction at J. So, so because this is the first time I'll, I'll maybe mention this. So this is, uh, restriction at pj okay so this is some notation uh, so i i introduce these two elements of e xij and yij so how do i get them i restrict the kappa uh, the cohomology class kappa i at the at the place pj and i know because it's a cyclotomic class it lands inside the space generated by lj and oj so this is l sub pj and l o sub pj but i'll just write lj and pj and and so these are the coefficients okay uh, and so the nice thing now is is kind of an not a difficult computation is this proposition that this uh, um, uh, p-adic regulator is in fact uh, ratio of determinant of xijs and yijs so these are r by r matrices Okay, so uh, so these are R by R matrices. Um, okay, X, I, J, one less than or equal to I, less than or equal to R, one less than or equal to J, uh, less than or equal to R, and similarly for Y, I, J. Okay, so Y, I, J is also, um, an R by R matrix. Um, you can show actually that uh, Y I J, the, the, the determinant, this determinant is not zero. Okay, so I'll not, I'll not prove this, but you can, you can show that this determinant is non-zero uh, by showing that if one of, I mean, if, if this determinant is zero, then, then uh, you can show that the, um, the classes that are, uh, uh, the, the classes that, uh, yeah, I mean, okay, you have to prove a slight strengthening of this proposition that, that we have, okay. Um, so instead of R1, if you take any, just, just a subset of R1, uh, you still have this proposition with this R replaced by the, by the order of, by the cardinality of that subset. So, so you can use the, you can use that to show uh, to show that this this determinant is non-zero, so this makes sense actually. This is a well-defined uh, uh, number. This this denominator is non-zero. Okay, conjecturally this numerator is non-zero as well. But as I said, we don't know that R P K is non-zero. So uh, yeah. Okay, so how, this is an easy computation again with positive duality. 
Um, and I should say that this kind of idea goes back to, to uh, I think, Greenberg Stevens, and I don't know if it kind of uh, uh, goes earlier as well, but uh, this, this kind of idea at least goes back to Greenberg Stevens. Um, to, uh, so, so, so this is what you could call a, a Right, so this is like an intermediate step. You show that your regulator is this, and then uh, as, as you can imagine, in, uh, we would like to, to construct homology classes so that this, this ratio is then related to L value, okay. uh, uh, the leading terms of periodic L function. Okay, so how do we, how do we prove this proposition? So uh, we already fixed, we already have these R primes, P1 up to PR, we have a fixed basis kappa one up to kappa r of uh, of h1 cyclotomic. Uh, now we have another set of indices. You take a e basis of this uh, this unit group. Okay, so u1 up to ur. So we know that this also has dimension r. Right. <clears throat> so lots of uh, three three sets three different sets of cardinality r. So it can be a bit confusing, but. Um, yeah, but here it goes. So, so Pothute duality tells you that for any uh, kappa in H1 sub R, so this is for any for any kappa in H1 sub R1. Okay, this holds. Um, what is this? You take restriction to uh, to PJ of kappa. Uh, you know that that's uh, that you know we just saw that that is uh, th that has a very explicit description, right? This one. So uh, so you can evaluate it at elements uh, in U, uh, elements U in in this set. Okay, so this 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 makes sense, and you sum over all um, uh, all the J's from one to R. So you're taking restriction at each element of. Uh, uh, each prime, uh, each element of R1, so at each prime, okay, and you sum them, and you, you, what you get is is uh, is zero, okay. So this is what what the date duality tells you. <clears throat> All right, so um, so I apply this to each of my kappa i's, and evaluate e each of my uh, uk's there, okay. So so I get this this uh, expression, okay? So now what does this mean? This means that, um, this means that uh, X i j or i and j times O j u k uh, for j and k, uh, uh, yeah is equal to minus uh, of y i j um, yeah, uh, times l j of u k u k okay so <clears throat> Some of, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, well, this is not quite true. Let me, uh, let me, let me write it like this. Determinant of this is same as determinant of this. Because if you think of, uh, if, if you think uh, what, what this is saying is, is uh, sum of, some of the rows of, of this R by R matrix is zero. So if, if some of the rows is, is zero, then determinant is zero. Okay. Uh, and so, so you get something, uh, you, you get this, and now you just have to rearrange it, right? So determinant of yj is non-zero, determinant of this oj uk is non-zero, and uh, uh, this minus sign has to go inside the normalization that, uh, that I had for definition of the regulator. So this is why the normalization sign exists. Um, yeah, so... So this is uh, this this orthogonality given by the Pothute duality is basically why this uh, why this thing holds. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, 
so again this this proposition uh, plays a crucial role i mean th this proposition was first proven for r equal to 1 and the same proof basically works for r bigger than 1 uh, so for r equal to 1 this was in uh, das gupta dharma and 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 for r bigger than 1 it's just notationally harder that's it okay um all right so that's the that's the proof that's a sketch of this this proposition what does this tell you so as i said earlier it it tells you that it's enough to construct cohomology classes kappa 1 up to kappa r so that when you restrict them to uh, to uh, places in r1 you get these xi j's and yi j's and you you have to prove that determinant of xi j divided by determinant of yi j is this uh, this l value that you want is this l value that you want okay so if r is equal to 1 you you have to construct precisely one cohomology class which is cyclotomic there's only one x and y, uh, and one y and you have to show that x divided by y is equal to this uh, this l, uh, this side Okay, this is exactly what Dasgupta, Dharma, and Pollock do. They construct a, a cyclotomic class, and they show that the slope of if you if you think about what this means is these x i j. I mean, um, you know, depending on how you normalize it, y by uh, x by y is a, is a, is is slope of this uh, cyclotomic class in the local uh, cohomology uh, group. So they construct a cyclotomic class whose slope is related to L. Okay, so this is exactly what they do. And one would think, okay, now if you can construct one, maybe you can construct two, three, and so on when R is R is two, three, and so on. Okay, uh, unfortunately that doesn't work. And uh, when R is bigger than one, uh, in general, we have no idea how to construct even a single cyclotomic class. So even, even the thing that the Gupta, Dharma, and Pollock do, uh, that thing kind of fails when R is bigger than uh, one. So we have no idea how to construct even a single cyclotomic class. <clears throat> Nevertheless, the, these ideas are, are very useful and that's why I presented them here. We will construct a cohomology class we will use this orthogonality relation from the previous uh, uh, propositions proof, uh, but we, we won't be able to show that we have constructed cyclotomic classes. Nevertheless, it's enough to, uh, what, what we can do is enough to, to prove gross star conjecture. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so there's an open question if you like, uh, can you construct R cyclotomic classes uh, when R is bigger than one? Okay, so uh, uh, so we 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 couldn't do. I mean, the the class that we construct it probably contains information about these R cyclotomic classes, uh, and and there are no more, uh, right? So so that it should be made out of these things somehow, but we don't know how to how to explicitly get cyclotomic classes from whatever we construct. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, All right, so, so that's kind of end of the cohomology part for now. Again, we change uh, topic and we go to cusp, construction of a cusp form. So let me uh, make some remarks before, before uh, going to the next section. <clears throat> so now, well, I mean, uh, so you can, you can ignore this remark for, for the moment that we don't know how to uh, construct cohomology classes when R is bigger than one. But, but uh, by whatever I said before that in this section, it's clear that constructing cohomology classes is, uh, Galois cohomology classes is, uh, is important, okay? And so how do we construct Galois cohomology classes? Well, <clears throat> there are kind of only two uh, systematic ways of doing this. One is uh, Euler systems, and there are no Euler systems in this setting, so there's no uh, Euler system over totally real fields that we can use here. Uh, and so the second uh, method is, is what is called Ribet's method. Okay. Uh, so we saw in Shonak's uh, talk that uh, uh, you can attach Galois representation to a cuspidal eigenform, and this Galois representation is absolutely irreducible. 
But what Ribet uh, noticed is that uh, if your cuspid, uh, cusp form is congruent to an Eisenstein series, let's say modulo P, then the Galois representation attached to the cusp form is also congruent to the Galois representation attached to the Eisenstein series mod P. So th there's a lot of thing I'm kind of uh, skipping here because uh, as Shonak mentioned, the, uh, like taking mod P, you have to choose a lattice and choice of lattice matters. And in fact, it plays a crucial role in, in Ribet's method. And we'll see that uh, next time. Uh, but uh, ignoring those technicalities, you, you know that the two Galois representations are also congruent modulo P. What this means is that even though your uh, representation attached to the cusp form is absolutely irreducible, modulo P, it becomes reducible, okay? Uh, but of course, mod P reducible does not mean uh, semi-simple, okay? So, uh, so you can actually choose a lattice in a nice way so that it's reducible, but not uh, uh, semi-simple, which means that it gives you an extension class, okay? Which means that it gives you an element in H1. Uh, so that's how you construct uh, elements in H1 using, uh, uh, representation, Galois representations attached to cusp forms. Okay, so this this idea goes back to to Ribet, and this is how he proved proved converse to Herbrand's theorem. Uh, and so once you kind of know Ribet's work and and uh, uh, generalization of of it by Mazur, Wiles, and Wiles, uh, this is the this is a natural thing to try to do. Uh, if you want to construct homology classes, you, you construct cusp forms, uh, which are congruent to Eisenstein series uh, modulo some ideal that you're interested in. Okay, so, uh, so if you have never seen this before, kind of jump from here to here is, is, a, is a huge one. But if you know Ribet's work and Wiles's work, then this is a natural thing to try to do. Okay, so, uh, so that's, what, uh, that's what one tries to do. Uh, so we want to construct a cusp form, okay, uh, which is which which is congruent to some Eisenstein series, uh, and you know modulo an ideal that we are interested in. So I'll 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 see all uh, uh, what what we are interested in, etc. Okay, so last time we saw that there is an Eisenstein series E one chi whose constant term is is essentially this, okay. Um, so maybe I should write it like this. So with constant terms, uh, so <clears throat> this, I mean, there are other factors, like, for instance, two to the minus uh, D, D is the degree of F over Q. And there are some things like, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, chi inverse of uh, T lambda and so on. But I'll, I'll just ignore, ignore those terms, those simple terms for the moment. The essential point is that the, the constant term contains this piadical function. Okay. So how do we get a how do we get a cusp form from this? So piadical function, if you if you look at the ideal generated by this piadical function, piadical function is an element in uh, in the Iwasawa algebra. So this is an element in lambda, right? Uh, so so this is an element in in uh, inside uh, lambda. And so what we know is that uh, this E1 chi looks cuspidal uh, modulo lambda, uh, modulo L, right? LP chi omega S, okay? Because if you look, this is a lambdaic form. And if you look at uh, these coefficients modulo modulo the L function, then, uh, then it looks like the, the constant term is not there. So it looks like it's cuspidal, you know, at least at infinity. And this is the, this is the starting point of Ribet's idea. Uh, so you, you ask yourself, is there actually a cusp form which is congruent to E modulo uh, the ideal generated by L? Uh, this, is, this is precisely what uh, Ribet did, he said, Okay, if you have a Bernoulli number, which is divisible by P, then mod P, the Eisenstein series looks cuspidal. So is there a honest cusp form, which is congruent to the Eisenstein series mod P? 
okay and so so this is uh, what what one usually does in ribet's wiles method is you take your form e the eisenstein series e and you subtract a particular thing from it okay so what you do is you construct a modular form a lambda adic modular form whose constant term is 1 so that when you multiply by the p adic l function the constant term is the p adic l function okay again i am ignoring those factors uh, uh, but you can just put them in because uh, um, you know the, this constant term is one so this is this is a very kind of uh, yeah, uh, not entirely correct if i just sorry if i say one here but anyway so the you 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 can just pretend that i have normalized my lambda adic um, Form E so that the constant term is exactly this. <laughs> okay, so um, so if I take this difference, then it is actually cuspidal. Okay, I am not saying that it's an eigen form, but it's at least cuspidal at infinity. So at infinity, there are uh, there are no constant terms. Okay, at the infinite cusp, uh, and we'll worry about other cusps uh, later on. Okay. Uh, Uh, so a remark here is that this g is kind of not known explicitly uh, uh, in fact so if you if you are uh, somewhat familiar with uh, das gupta dharmapolok's work then they had a um, they had an assumption saying leopold conjecture holds for uh, f and p and and that was precisely to construct this g in some explicit form but you don't need that you can you can construct this g otherwise as well as uh, as as we'll soon see um oh no no sorry this no no uh, i i jumped ahead this g is much weaker than what darmodos said to you okay yeah so 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 this g can be constructed without uh, the leopold yeah so this is this is what happens in wiles uh right you take e and then you subtract certain uh, form from it so that at infinity there are no constant terms the constant term is zero but you only know this form modulo l this l l function right whereas we want to recognize the the cons the the leading term right so so if this is uh, somehow uh, has order r we want to know what happens modulo s to the r plus 1 okay? this is only telling you something modulo s so this is not good enough so one of the kind of important insights of uh, the skupta dharma and polox paper was to say that you can actually do a more refined construction okay so you can refine the construction of wiles um uh, you can get a very uh, fine refinement of, of you know very you know like non trivial refinement of wiles's construction so that you you get some information modulo s to the r plus 1 and not just modulo s to the r okay uh, so that you can say something about the leading term uh, and uh, of of the periodic l function so i'll i'll say a word about i'll i'll roughly kind of tell you what this construction is uh, Yeah. so what you do is instead of taking uh, yeah and, and the other thing is this construction of wiles it never sees the complex l function okay it never sees this complex l function which which appears in the formula so you want to see it here as well um, okay all right so so the the insight was you can you can do such a refinement okay so what you do is you you still have your e1 chi now you you take a different kind of g what kind of g do you take this is called lift of hasse invariant for those who know what this means uh, for those who don't know it it means that this is a lambda adic form whose constant term is 1 and whose non constant terms are all divisible by t remember that lambda is uh, uh, this kind of ring I, i don't know if i used o sub e but it's this kind of ring so all the non constant terms are divisible by t and the constant term is 1 okay um right uh, so this is this is what you obtain by 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 taking uh, lift of hasse invariant you you lift hasse invariant and then that's that's a actually not a lambda adic modular form but just a modular form and you take you take all its powers and that that is the heta family uh, 
So, um, so that's how you get G. And then this is the usual sort of uh, ordinary um, Eisenstein series. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is ordinary in the technical sense, but it's just a complex valued thing. This is not a lambdaic thing. Okay. So the constant term of this E1 is precisely this. The constant term of this is this. The constant term of this is one. So when you take this linear combination, this has no constant term at infinity. Okay. This has no constant term at infinity. So this is just like the situation of Ribets and Wiles. So what have we gained? Well, this is divisible by T to the R if we use that notation. So this is uh, in T to the R. And this is, this is one modulo T to the uh, modulo T. So we understand this whole thing uh, somehow uh, modulo T to the R plus one. Okay. So that's the, that's the whole point. That is what we, what we gain by doing such a construction. So I think this is an important, this is a, one of the most important ideas from that, uh, from the paper of Daskutta Dharma and Polo. Okay, so, um, so let, me, let me say a little bit more about this G and this construction. Okay, so, so I'll give you a few more details of the construction. So what is this G? So this G is a lambdaic form so that, <clears throat> so now I, I'm kind of, um, um, you know, uh, so there's some G tilde, I mean, okay, I'll, I'll write something down and then maybe say what I mean, uh, whatever. Okay, so when you take the, when you take the weight K specialization of a, of a lambda addict uh, thing, you should get a weight K form. But, uh, but this G is kind of shifted by one weight. And, and the way to, do, to shift this is you take the usual lambdaic form and then do such a change of variable. And that's how you shift the, uh, the weight. And the reason why you need to shift the weight is because you're multiplying by something of weight one. Okay. So when you take weight K specialization of this, uh, you get a weight K form. So when you take the weight K specialization of this, you, this G should give you a weight K minus one form because you're already multiplying by a weight K form, okay? <clears throat> so, uh, so there's this proposition. So Hida proved the, I mean, this result that lift of Hasse invariant exists. This is due to Hida. It appears in a paper of Wiles and he attributes it to Hida. So um, I, haven't, I have not seen it in a paper of Hida. But anyway, so this uh, proposition is due to Hida that there exists a form, a lambdaic form, so that when you special weight k specialization gives you a, a form of um, weight k minus one, whose constant terms are all one, and whose weight one specialization is just just one. Okay, literally one. I'm not saying constant term or anything. This is saying that the non-constant terms are all divisible by t. Okay. All right, so, so there exists that form and then we again take this. So this, as I said, has no constant terms at infinity. Okay, constant terms at infinity are all uh, zero. That, does, that doesn't guarantee you that it's actually, a, uh, that doesn't guarantee you that it's actually um, uh, 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 a cusp form, right? You, you have to, for, for, for a modular form to be a cusp form, uh, constant terms at all uh, Q expansions at all cusp have to be zero. Okay, so F tilde is not uh, quite cuspidal. It is what is called semi-cuspidal. And then this kind of thing already appears in, in, uh, in Wiles, how to get from semi-cuspidal to cuspidal. Uh, so um, so, so this, this result is kind of due to Wiles, that if you take any modular form, you can write it as a sum of cusp forms. Well. The, yeah, I mean, explicitly this appear, appears in Wiles for Hilbert modular forms, but this is probably well known, uh, was well known earlier as well, that any modular form can be written as cusp form plus uh, uh, Eisenstein series, okay? So we want to kill this these Eisenstein series somehow. 
And what, uh, what you can do is you can take a very specific uh, Hecke operator, which kills each of these Eisenstein series. So, so you get, uh, once you apply that, uh, that I, Hecke, Hecke operator, uh, you just get a cusp form. Okay. And you also have to apply this E, this is he does uh, uh, ordinary operator. So you saw this in, in Schoenach's talk as well, that uh, you take UP uh, to the N factorial and you take limit as N goes to infinity. Okay. So that's how you, you, uh, you hope to get, um, uh, uh, get a cusp form. Well, things don't quite work uh, this way. Uh, if you if you just use um, whatever while state, so to go from cuspidal uh, uh, from from a semi cuspidal form to a cuspidal form, so this works when um, when R is not uh, uh, empty set. So when there is a prime above P which is not completely split in um, in um, in H, uh, this whatever I said up to this slide. Uh, that literally works. What happens when R is equal to the empty set is you can't uh, quite kill one of the Eisenstein series without messing up what you want to do, okay? So the Hecke operator that you would use to kill that Eisenstein series basically kills your whole argument. Uh, you know, it, it kind of uh, uh, kills, uh, kills these, these terms as well that you, that you wanted to do leave alone. So, um, so what you have to do is you have to actually uh, take a more complicated construction uh, when R is empty, okay? When all the primes above P uh, split completely in H. So what is that? This is the, the term that we already had, but we also have to uh, add this kind of term. We also have to add E chi comma one, okay? We had E one comma chi, we also have to add some multiple of e uh, chi comma one. Uh, and, and the reason for this is that, uh, so the reason why you, you, don't need, you don't see this thing when R is, um, um, is non-empty is that E, uh, this kind of thing, if you take the weight K specialization of this, um, then, uh, or, or, or weight one specialization even, then this will be E, uh, so weight one specialization of E chi one, this kind of thing is simply E one chi R one, and this is not ordinary. Okay, so, so E, of E1 chi R1 is zero. So E kills this. So even though kind of you can just take this particular, you can just take this particular construction uh, irrespective of whether R is empty or not, you don't actually see it in the end when R is uh, not empty. Okay. Uh, so that's the, that's the, that's the thing. So you, you can't really kill this uh, thing. So you have to take this more complicated construction. So this will be, this is case two. So from now on, I'll basically uh, just be in case one. I'll say what the modifications are required for case two, uh, but in the rest of the 10 minutes today and, and tomorrow's uh, talk, I'll, I'll try to finish the proof of low star conjecture. So, um, so, but we'll only see it in case one. Okay. Uh, so case two actually uh, further divides into two cases, depending on, you, you see there are two L functions here, LP of chi omega and LP of chi inverse omega. Uh, and if we believed the first conjecture of Gross, then uh, their order of vanishings are the same, but we don't know uh, whether that conjecture is true or not. So we have to, uh, consider two cases, uh, whether order of LP chi omega is bigger than order of LP chi inverse omega or the other way around. So, um, okay, all right. Um, yeah, so now just a slight change of note, uh, variable here. 
I, I don't want to use this T, but I want to use this kind of thing, uh, T divided normal, I mean, yeah, just normalize T by uh, log sub T to the U. This just makes uh, certain statements nicer. Okay. Uh, anyway, the, the upshot of all the previous discussion was that now you have a cusp form, okay? Uh, so, uh, so this is a cusp form, not necessarily um, eigen form, okay? So this is a cusp form and it's, it will almost surely not be an eigen form yeah, unless uh, it is for some trivial reason, like, you know, it's zero or something because we are, uh, we, because R is zero, <laughs> some such thing. Uh, but otherwise it will not be a, uh, not be an eigen form. Um, and so there's no Galois representation attached to this directly. What you have to do is you have to take the whole uh, kind of Hecke orbit of, uh, of this, uh, thing and, and look for eigenforms in that orbit and consider all those at once. So this is what we'll do next time, okay? But the upshot of this whole section is now we have some cusp form and we know, so yeah, we, we'll just work about with, uh, with, uh, with, um, with this kind of thing. We'll just work with this kind of thing because we are in case one and we know how, how Hecke operators act on this modulo S to the R plus one. Okay, so this is what we are going to see next, uh, like what the action of the Hecke operators is. Now that we have a cusp form, we can ask how Hecke operators act on them. So even though that's not an eigen form, we can calculate the action fairly explicitly modulo uh, uh, pi to the r. Now, now I'm using the variable pi, so pi to the r plus one. Uh, so there's a slight difference in all these variables, s, t, and pi. And, uh, to make it kind of correct uh, in the way that I'm writing it, I, I need to make this change of variable. Okay, so I think we saw um, Hecke algebra in Shonak's talk, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, at least we saw Hecke operators TL and, and UP and so on. Uh, so, so this T is, is the cuspidal lambda adic Hecke algebra, which is generated by TL and, and, uh, and all the U Qs for, for Q dividing N and P. So N is the conductor of chi. So I did not introduce this notation uh, earlier. It's conductor of chi I denote by N. And uh, so this is basically uh, the lambda adic uh, uh, submodule of endomorphisms of the, uh, the space of cusp forms, which is generated by these uh, things, these operators. Okay. <clears throat> All right, um, I, I introduce uh, some more notation. So I, I'm not assuming that conjecture one is true. Okay? So that's why I, I, I introduce R sub N. So analytic rank kind of thing, analytic uh, R is the order of vanishing of this periodical function at S equal to zero. Okay, so conjecturally this is same as R, but since I'm not assuming that I, I'll I'll use a different notation. And then the leading term normalized in this way, I denote by L and star chi, okay? All right, so this is the thing that we have to show is equal to the periodic regulator, at least when, uh, when R n is equal to R. And when R n is bigger than R, we have to show that the periodic regulator is zero. Okay. Um, all right, so again, I'll state the theorem in case one. So this is case one, uh, case one, right? <clears throat> and I'm, I'm going to maybe state uh, the theorem in case two next time, uh, but it has a more complicated statement, okay? So let's say that there exists a prime above P, which does not split completely in H, then what do we have? We have this easier construction of the cusp form, which gives us a lambda algebra homomorphism from, from T, from this Hecke algebra into some ring W and it's uh, uh, surjective. So let me write that here. Okay. 
Okay, it's it's surjective. Um, where W is this explicit ring? Okay, so it's a ring of uh, polynomials in R plus one variable over E. But I mod it out by some ideal. What is that ideal? So first of all, this is the important bit. I want to understand what happens modulo pi to the R plus one, right? Uh, well, if conjecture one fails, I can do better. I can understand it modulo r n modulo uh, pi to the r n plus one. Uh, by the way, this looks very nice that you, you know if conjecture one fails, you seem to be getting more information. But yeah, I, I don't know how to get anything more out of this uh, beyond sort of what we can do with gross stuff. You also mod it out by epsilon uh, i squared. Your, and epsilon i times pi is also zero. But this is the most important and nice relation. If you take product of all the epsilon i's, uh, then it is equal to um, this, analyt this analytic uh, invariant times pi to the r m. Okay, so product of all these epsilons, it sees the, the L function that we want. Okay, so this is really the, the fantastic thing. So you you know you should you should see this theorem as, as a bridge between the between the algebraic and the analytic because uh, this 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 map is kind of algebraically defined. I mean you know algebraically defined in the sense that uh, this is uh, this Hecke algebra is is kind of an algebraic object that will relate to Galois representations uh, later on. And you see the analytic uh, periodic analytical function here uh, through this homomorphism. Okay. So what is this map? You can tell what this map does to these Hecke operators. So one plus TL goes to, uh, sorry, TL goes to one plus chi times epsilon uh, of L. So this is the cyclotomic character, lambda adic cyclotomic character ul for all l which are either in r or above n so not the interesting ones but just no, not in r1 but the other one ul just acts as identity so that's nice and up it acts in a in a very complicated way so it, it goes to one plus epsilon i. So this epsilon i is kind of a variable that we introduce because we don't know the action of uh, UPI in some you know in in, in some way. So so we introduce this variable. We don't know how to what exactly these variables do, but we know all these relations uh, uh, for them. So that's good enough to kind of get whatever we want. Um, so this epsilon i, in, in, you know, it's it's because we don't exactly this to, to explain this complicated action. But then this we get this nice relation through these epsilon i's. Okay, so uh, so this is a this is a sort of a important theorem. I don't uh, maybe I'll go over by a couple of minutes if that's okay. I just want to say how one proves this theorem. Okay, so what you do is you uh, you calculate the uh, the action of Hecke operators on on this uh, on this f. Okay, so f is f. Remember, was uh, some t times e uh, applied to to f tilde. Okay, so you calculate the action of Hecke operators on these, and you see that T L acts like this, U L acts like this, U P acts in a certain way, and um, uh, so yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll I'll go over the details next time. Uh, but let me just let me just say how UP acts, um, uh, and, and maybe that will make uh, clear what the relationship is. So if you if you look at action of UP on F tilde, then it does nothing to this. It acts as one on uh, on this. Okay, it acts as uh, it acts as one on this. So. Uh, UPI acts as uh, one, but the but the nice uh, but the kind of more complicated thing is how it acts on this weight one form. Okay, so it sends the weight one form to uh, 
so so okay what i mean is that upi of e1 1 chi r this is e1 1 chi r plus e1 1 chi r union pi okay so it acts like this so that's why that's why we get this thing when when you px on f tilde we get this extra term okay and now you see that if you if you make you so if you take u p minus one acting on f tilde you just get this term. So that's how you get all these relations because if you if you if you define this to be epsilon minus epsilon i then epsilon times pi is just this thing times pi and you already have pi to the r and here so uh, if you multiply by another pi you get zero. So that's how you get that's how you get this relationship. Okay, when you make <clears throat> up minus upi minus one act on this, uh, it acts on this as zero. So, so that's how you get the relation epsilon i squared. Okay, and when you take product of all the uh, epsilon i's, uh, you you get basically this with chi uh, kind of uh, stabilized at all primes above uh, 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 all primes in R. And you can show that this is also congruent to this modulo uh, pi to the r plus one. So that's how you get this relationship. Okay. So this this r is actually an r and not r n. By the way, that's not a. Uh, this is not a typo here. It may be a typo in in our paper actually, or in one of the versions of maybe archive version or something. So this r is actually an r. Uh, so that's how you get this relationship. Uh, so that's uh, so. Th this is essentially how you you prove the theorem. Uh, maybe I'll give more details next time. Uh, maybe not, but uh, we'll we'll see. Uh, sorry, I'll I'll stop here. I can't hear anything, so not sure what's happening. I think Debargo is muted. Uh, can he not unmute? Ah, okay, now I can unmute. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Mahesh, for a wonderful talk. Okay, so any questions? I think there is a question. This is a Martin. Yeah, once you said, uh, uh, is there a reason why you define this to be cyclotomic classes? Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Yeah, I, I don't have a convincing uh, reason for that terminology. I mean, I mean, this log of norm of some, I mean, norm of something is the, is the cyclotomic character, right? So, uh, so the cyclotomic character gives you norm. So, and then you're taking log of that. So I think that's the reason why it's called cyclotomic class. Because it's in the class generated by that uh, log of norm of uh, U and odd of uh, U. Sorry. Uh, sorry, do you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Very good. Uh, I have a question. In fact, um, in your lecture, there is many analytic stuff. And uh, also today, uh, we saw some algebraic stuff. And uh, there is some interpretation between them, yeah. as you said. Uh, is there a, a, a geometric interpretation? for these things, like uh, in terms of uh, modular curves, I mean, or something like that. Yeah, so definitely, I mean, I don't see any direct relation with modular curves. So these are Hilbert modular forms. So things are happening kind of on Hilbert modular varieties. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, but um, I, yeah, I think what is happening is kind of essential. I mean, very much 
uh, arithmetic so i i don't see any way of uh, yeah geometrically interpreting ribet's method for example so i'll i'll what i'll do is some kind of refinement of ribet's method and uh, in in all these years there have been no geometric kind of interpretation of ribet uh, stuff in some sense um i, I mean so, so. you you know you can write things down in in some way uh, which is kind of uh, so what is happening is uh, uh, so i i am considering congruences between sort of cusp form and eisenstein series so if you look at the some eigen variety uh, which basically interpolates uh, hecke hecke eigen values of forms then there are some you know so, some components of eigen varieties are are crossing so there's a uh, th there's this e which is the eisenstein family and then there's this f which is a cuspidal family and then they are crossing somewhere and this crossing is giving you some extension class so uh, uh, so there's that there's that kind of piadic geometric interpretation that one could have for these uh, constru construction of chromology classes uh, wow very nice and, and uh, can one use uh, this geometric point of view to make some arguments some uh, equivalent arguments for for these proofs Or, or maybe, for example, a, maybe a simpler argument or... Yeah, I don't or, or, think there's a more conceptual way of writing this. Basically. Yeah, I mean, you have to... Even, even if you... I mean, even this, this particular construction of cusp form, you really have to uh, uh, take... I mean, you really have to understand explicitly what the constant terms that are at various cusp forms or... you know what the or at least at some of the cusp form what the constant terms are or which which eisenstein series appear when you get the semi cusp form uh, you really mm -hmm. have to to do that i mean uh, like okay one sort of uh, tangential remark i would make is when you construct so the so so shona can i both talked about lambda adic modular forms uh, and cusp forms in particular and these cusp forms have some kind of abstract uh, construction uh, by by yeah. by hida which is sort of you construct the hecke uh, hecke algebra and, and through that you construct these uh, lambdaic families but there are no kind of abstract conceptual construction of uh, lambdaic uh, families of eisenstein series you essentially just have to look at the Uh, for the expansion of eisenstein series and say that you can actually interpolate each of the coefficient uh, oh, so it's yeah. a, it's a bit like that here also you can't really give a abstract construction of these uh, cusp forms you you have to kind of uh, look at these things explicitly and and then get a get a cusp form this this has been sort of you know this 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 work of ribet has been generalized in many ways uh, um like to prove uh, the result uh, that skinner urban do and ming lun shay does and it's always very explicit uh, yeah, i don't see any more conceptual way of writing this oh, oh, very very good thank thank you very much thank you thank okay. you any more questions comments remarks if not let's thank mahesh thank you very much